today's uh, CPM seminar. Uh, so today it's uh, my great pleasure to have Professor uh, Bivenu uh, uh, Dognu to, to give us um, uh, a talk on quantum microscopy using specially correlated photons. Uh, so Bivenu holds the uh, Quebec uh, MEIE uh, research chair in quantum photonics, uh, which is uh, in the similar role as uh, Philip and I, <laughs> and uh, so so and um, and Bivenu got his uh, PhD in physics uh, in from the University of uh, uh, Witwatersrand in South Africa. He worked as a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Glasgow from 2018 to 2021 before uh, joining the Fraunhofer Center for Applied Photonics, uh, still in Glasgow from uh, 2021 to uh, 2023. And then uh, he takes up his post as associate professor at the Center for uh, Energy Materials Telecommunications at the NRS uh, in 2023 this year. Okay, so um, I'll just leave the floor to you. So, thank you, Kai. Thank you, guys, for anyone who's coming. So, I know it's a very early morning. I'm tired a bit, but thank you guys for showing up. So, Kai, you ruined a bit my introduction, but it's fine. I got some slides prepared for exactly that matter. So, today I want to talk to you about some of the work that I've done in quantum microscopy with spatially correlated photons. And just before we get into that, I didn't know what was the audience. So some of the concept might seem a bit basic. I decided to start from the basics and all the way to what the research was about. So I hope you don't get bored. But uh, just to go tell you a little bit more about myself. So originally I'm from Congo, that's why I came in half in Africa. And uh, did my PhD, my all my graduate studies from undergraduate graduate studies in South Africa at the University of the Vitvatus Rounds and then shipped off to do a postdoc at the University of Glasgow all the way in Scotland. So I spent about two and a half years there. Then, uh, oh, see, 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 I'll have to update that. So I did then uh, two and a half years again at the front of the Institute for Quantum Technology, working with industry. And uh, now I've shipped off to the NRS in Bahrain, which is on the other side of the river. So if you get a chance to visit that side again, you're welcome to visit the lab as well. And uh, so just now that we're done with introduction, so I'm going to start with a few concepts about what quantum imaging is about. So it's all about using correlations to reconstruct an image at the single photon level. And there's multiple ways in which that can be done. One of the first ways in which we usually do this, so I'm going to show you three methods and I'll focus on just one of them, which is the one that my research has been about. And then I'll come back to the other two at the end. So the first one is what we call interference-based quantum imaging. So generally in, the, in quantum imaging you want, you have a source of quantum states. In our case, we always use, generally use a sort of quantum pairs, generally from spontaneous parametric down conversion for those that are familiar with this, but I'll explain that a bit later, where you have a source that emits two photons. One we call signal, the other one we call it idler. And then the idler will interact with some objects that you want to image. And then at the end, you recombine the signal idler back into another source of photon pairs. And then from this source, you will only look at the signal, and then you will obtain your detection of the object that you were looking at. So you see here, this is quite interesting because the signal never interacts with the object, but that's the one that's used to reconstruct the object itself. And we completely discard the idler that saw the object. So it unlocks some quite interesting ways of doing imaging. If you go in a lab, you might, your experimental setting might look something like this. So you see here, there is a laser that forms a nonlinear crystal on this side, which produces, this is your photon pair source. And then one of the photon here interacts with an object at this point. And then this is recombined with a pump laser here into another nonlinear crystal, so this guy here. And at the end, we discard the idler in red, and we just keep the signal that doesn't see the object, but that is used to, re to reconstruct the object. So there was a paper that was uh, relatively you know, old about using uh, undetected light to do imaging. It was the title of this paper here. And 
what you obtain at the end is that if you go carefully to the map, you will see that this is a nonlinear maximum data for Omitter. And what you see at the end is uh, on your on your camera here is two different patterns of the two beams here that shows you the interference pattern that you see of the objects. So here, this image here is phase sensitive. So if you vary the phase of the interferometer, you will see the contrast changing here. And you can use that then to reconstruct the shape of the object that you were looking at. The second method is what we call entanglement-based quantum imaging. The way it works is, again, we have our source of photon pairs. And then in this case, both of the photons interact with the object. And then both of them are detected at the end. So this one has certain advantages. So again, this is an experimental set for it. So this is your source of entanglement of photons is here. And then the object is on this side here. You send the two photons on the object, and then you detect the two of them. What this allows you to do is to use the entanglement phase of the two photon state to reconstruct your image. And this has the benefit of giving you a super resolution in the phase. So unlike classical interferometry, when you use this way of doing interferometry at the quantum level with quantum states, what you get is a twice the resolution in the phase and the square root of two improvement in the spatial resolution. So this is, for example, a phase image. This is what was obtained with the classical interferometer at the same wavelength as the photons here. And this one is with the quantum interferometer. The benefit is, is a bit marginal at this point, but it has been shown multiple times that you get a very good resolution in the phase compared to classical interferometry. So these are some of the benefits of using this configuration. And the last one, which I'm going to talk mostly about, is called correlation-based quantum imaging. Now, similarly to the first setup that I showed, one of the photon interact with the object, but both of them are detected at the end. Now, there is a famous a uh, demonstration that is often called gold, quantum ghost imaging. I don't know who's familiar with this, but the ghost stands from the fact that the object that is used to, uh, the beam that's reconstructing the object does not see the object itself. So again, here we have a source of photon pair, which is here. This beam here in red is the one that sees the object and is detected with a single pixel detector. So what that means here is that your detector here has zero spatial resolution. So you cannot use that to reconstruct the object. But when you measure that in coincidence with a spatial result detector, which is a camera, with the other light beam, which does not see the object, then you're able to reconstruct the pattern of the objects that was seen by the detector that doesn't have any spatial resolution. Now, the reason why this is very interesting is because this allows you to operate in a regime where these two light beams here have very different wavelengths. For example, these images were taken with an illumination in the infrared here and a detection with visible light. And the ability to tune the, this difference within only depends on the crystal that you use for imaging and generating your photons. So that means that you can have configuration where you could generate, for example, this in, in a region of, of the spectrum, which is interesting for you know, some spectroscopic analysis. And then you do the reconstruction, the imaging here with the visible lights, because we have mostly detectors that are sensible in the visible. We have some in the infrared, but they're generally extremely expensive and very noisy. So this is one way to get around this using a nonlinear detection. So in the next part, I will go down, I'll try to explain a little bit more about how, you know, why we use this method of generating photons and what's the interesting principle behind it. So in spontaneous parametric non-conversion, you would have a photon, as we call a pump photon, which you send into a nonlinear crystal. What would happen is that this photon would then be absorbed and then re-emitted as a pair of photons, which have different wavelengths compared to the pump photons. And the process is, is done in such a way that it conserves energy and momentum. Now, the conservation of energy is simply written in here in terms of frequency, sum of frequencies. And then in terms of momentum, you've seen that here I've got a delta K that which I call the crystal momentum. This is because, because of the dispersion, the sum of momentum of the two photons does not always add up to that of the pump. Sometimes you need an additional momentum that you need to add again 
which is provided here by the crystal. So this is usually done by polling the crystal with a certain period, which allows you then to complete this equation here. And this has uh, interesting properties in the spatial domain, because from the conservation of momentum, you can simply do a very simple vector addition. If my pump is here, my crystal, my signal photon could have this momentum, my idle photon could have this momentum, my crystal would have a certain momentum here. But it must also always be in such a way that it adds up to the momentum of the pump. Now, what that means is that because I engineer my crystal in a certain way, so I know generally what this momentum is, if I, always, if I measure this momentum on, of the signal, then automatically it will determine what the idle momentum has to be, which is the general properties of correlated states. So you get two different configurations. In the first is what we call non-degenerate down conversion, in which the signal and idler would have different momenta and different wavelengths, which is this, what we had in the setup I showed earlier. Or you have degenerate down conversion where the two have the same wavelengths. And if you were to go in a laboratory, generally this is what you would see on the camera. This would be a nonlinear crystal, which you pump with a generally a UV beam. And then you get a beam that looks like a ring, for example, which is emitted in the near infrared. And if I was to ask you then, where would you measure your entangled photons? Well, you would think about conservation of momentum. If I measure one photon here, then the other one must be here. And generally that's what we do when we have single pixel detectors. You will set it in such a way that you are looking at this part of the, of the beam and this other part of the beam as well to capture only the photons that are anti-correlated because that's where your entanglement would lie. If you decide to measure it here and then something on this side, obviously there's no correlation between those two and you will not be able to see anything. So if you measure again at a different angle, the pairs will always be on that side. Again, if you measure it with a different angle, then its counterpart will always be on the other side. Now, this is an expression of conservation of momentum, linear momentum in this case. You can also get a conservation in angular momentum as well. So you see here, if you pump your nonlinear crystal with a photon that has a certain angular momentum, then the angular momenta of the signal and idler will always be correlated as well. So this was an experiment that was done in the early 2000s to measure the entanglement in orbital angular momentum of light. So what we do now is uh, we have a conservation of momentum which gives us spatial correlation. We know how to generate our entangled photon. And we know that if you have a single pixel detectors, we're going to be capturing a piece of this entire light that's emitted. But since we want to do imaging, we want to make use of all the lights that has been generated in the down conversion process. And the way we do it is by measuring it with a camera. And the measurement with the camera requires a bit of tricks. And depending on the camera technology that you use, you would have to do some extra steps or not. So this, for example, is a spy camera, single photon avalanche diode camera. This has an array, the camera, this camera model has an array of uh, 32 by 64 pixels and a timing resolution of about 10 nanoseconds. So what we'll be looking at in the in when we do imaging with the with quantum states is uh, what we call the correlation width, which is what determines our resolution. So when the photons are emitted in a nonlinear crystal, what happens is that you get a pump photon that then creates a pair of photons here. And these two photons are born within a certain region of your crystal, which is called a birth zone. And that has a certain width. And as you go propagate through the crystal, this correlation width as well will propagate inside this crystal here. And the width of this birth zone here depends on the length of your crystal and the wavelength of your pump. So as I propagate here, this due to the natural diffraction of light, then this will get bigger and bigger and bigger. So when I do my imaging, I need to be careful about what is the size of this correlation width based on my experimental parameters that will determine my resolution. And my optics that I put after will determine whether I'm imaging 
this correlation width or this one. So you need to be very careful when you do your imaging planes because that could affect your resolution and contrast of the image you get at the end. So what we do is that when we pump the nonlinear crystal, this will, for example, I demonstrated the pump as this giant circle of purple. What we do is that inside the crystal, we excite a lot of correlation points. So you get pairs emitted at this region of the crystal, here, 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 and everywhere around here. At the end, what I'm looking to do is to measure each one of these correlation weights. That will be constituting in my image a single pixel. So I always try to match the size of each correlation width to a pixel on the detector. So that I know by given how many correlation weights I'm exciting, I know how many spatial modes that I'm using to do my imaging. And I can control the number of, of uh, of relevant correlation with that I'm using by just changing the size of the pump. So if I pump only one of them, I would have a very poor resolution at the end. If I pump with a large pump, then I'll have a good resolution at the end because I get more details given that the correlation will excite a lot of spatial mode in this case. So in terms of camera technology, there are generally two leading technologies in the field, the CCD and the CMOS, uh, CMOS based cameras. So these are EMCCDs. So we search for electron multiplying CCD. These generally have a very good high, very good quantum efficiency, generally of upward of 90%. It's got a very high fill factor. I'll show you a bit later why this is important generally. It's got a very dense pixel array. So you get megapixel array generally with the EMCCDs, but they tend to be very slow. You get about, when we say slow, is about one kilohertz. The temporal resolution as well is in the microsecond region, which is not great depending on experiments that you want to do. Then there's some electronic noise associated with the CCD technology that you have to compensate when you do your measurements. On the other hand, we have a spot-based cameras. They've got generally quantum efficiency up to 70%, they tend to peak in a green to blue region where we generally don't have many sources of entangled photons. So for example, in the near infrared, that can go all the way down to a couple of percent. Generally, they have a low field factor. Some of them have a, a set of micro lens arrays on a pixel just to increase the numerical aperture. They've got a less dense array, generally kilopixel, but they tend to be very fast, about a hundred times to a thousand times faster than the EMCC. They've got good temporal resolution, and the only sources of noise that you have to contend with is dark counts. So by using good filters and isolating from stray light, generally you reduce your dark counts quite significantly compared to the electronic noise, which is always present in all your measurements with a CCD camera. So these factors generally comes into play when we look at what happens when we measure photons with these cameras. So this, for example, I've represented an array of a pixelated sensor. When you generate your, your pairs of photons, as I told you before, I've represented them here just as before as a pair with the, with the dotted circle around it. But because you also have photons from the surroundings, you can get noise from photons hitting your sensors as well. Now, when you look at the collecting your data, you see that you cannot just take a full image array and automatically tell which one are your entangled photons, which ones are not. This is particularly true because generally, these sensors do not have the ability to resolve the number of photons that hits each pixel. For a spy sensor, for example, if you have two photons on one, it will only give you a signal as if only one photon hits it. So in the MCC, you can sort of do it, but the noise makes it difficult to distinguish a signal from two to one. So if you've got three, that's even worse. So there are some ways to get around it. There are some novel sensors that are that have this ability, but uh, I won't talk about them today. And the fill factor that I mentioned before comes in the case where you have a correlation with that falls in between two pixels. You can see if these two pixels are very far apart, then I would measure maybe one and use the other. So this is what is good to have a camera with a high four factor because you get less losses at the detection stage. So what we have to deal with now is uh, even that these four factor important number resolution generally we can't do much about, 
But we have stray photons or dark counts that we have to deal with when we do the measurements. And we have to find a way to isolate these from our signal from photon pairs here. And the way we do it is usually by just acquiring a lot of data and doing very simple matrix multiplication. So what we do is um, we acquire a lot of images, generally a million to about 10 million. This is where speed is very important. If you have a high speed, then you can take this quickly. But in the MCC, this can take you from a few hours to a few days to maybe a week. So once you have your data, what you do is you multiply each, each frame that you acquire with itself. So what that does is that you get your, you take an image multiplying with itself, you're finding the correlation of each image with itself, which as we mentioned before, if you've got two photons hitting your sensor, then that signal will be amplified. But if you have stray photons as well, that signal will also be amplified when you do the correlation of each frame with itself. So this is the first time here, we multiply each image with itself, but then at the end of it, we want to get rid of the noise. So what we do is we try to estimate what is the structure of the noise and what it looks like. So what you do so is we take each image and we multiply with every other image but itself. And then we average that over the number of images that we take. So this is the second term here. So you can see this as a calculation of the signal plus noise minus the noise. So by doing that, we can reconstruct then the intensity correlation between the two photons that we created in down conversion. And this gives us this object here, which in the spatial domain is a four dimensional object. It's proportionally it's depending on the degrees of freedom of photon one and photon two. So one representation of it is uh, as follows. So I've put them in terms of coordinates of photon one and coordinates of photon two. So what this looks like practically is that each row or each column in here represents an image. So to get this representation, you can imagine if I've got a four by four, I can turn that into a line of 16 rows by one. This will be one of the columns or one of the rows here. And then what you see at the end is this diagonal signal here, and then some strays on the side as well. I'll show you why you get the, the pixels on the sides there. So generally you want to have a signal like this because you want to match each coordinate of, of uh, photon one with one coordinate of photon two. That's what you try to achieve in general. Now, the reason why you get the spray light on the side is because generally your correlation rate could be a little bit larger than a pixel, in which case it will hit the surrounding pixel as well. So you can, you can get correlation between one pixel and its corresponding one and a few around it as well sometimes. And that's what you would get when you see those lines on the side. It's just correlation with neighboring pixels that show up this way. So practically what that looks like is that if I then go in the lab, I've got my laser that pumps my nonlinear crystal. I get some photons here to get rid of the pump. And then I image that crystal onto a camera using a one lens. So the configuration is FF. So I'm looking at the far fields of the crystal onto the camera. So this is something that I would probably see. And now if I want to check that I'm go I've got momentum correlation, I will do my acquisition that I've shown you before. And then I'll interrogate the, the four-dimensional object by saying if I measure what's on here, so in the context is if I'm here and I pick one of the lines here or one of the columns. What does the image look like when I reassemble it as an image? So that's saying if I measure something at A or B, what would I see? So let's say it would pick one of the columns, one of the, the words here for A or B, and then we turn that back into an image. What it looks like is something like this. You see that you get a peak somewhere on the other side here. Now that's only because the correlation rate sometimes is a bit larger than the pixel, you get some lights around it as well in the neighboring pixels. So now what that tells me is that if I measure a photon here and A, this partner photon has a probability of being measured on this side. If I measure a photon at B, the partner photon has a probability of being measured at this position here, which follows exactly what you said about momentum conservation. So you can do that in both the near field and the far field. So this was a measurement in the far field. Now, if you go into the near field, 
what you'll do in bed into a 12 12 configuration. So your near fit will look something like this, for example. And you see that now, if I'm at A, which is somewhere here, I will get a point at the corresponding base. Because as we said in the beginning, the two photons are born at the same place. So if I measure one photon at one place, this proton photon will be at the same place if I'm looking at the plane of the crystal. But as they propagate, momentum correlation takes over and they end up in opposite sides when I look at the camera. That's why you get the two different representations here, momentum and position. So what can we do with this? One thing we can do is to revisit the concept of classical optics or holography. So generally in holography, you, have, you would have an initial field here, which will illuminate an object, your phase object, which will modify your field. And then you will use the reference fields, which will be able to modulate, which will, you will be able to modulate somehow. And at the end, you will superimpose the reference field with your output fields to get a superposition. And then from the intensity measurement, you'll be able to reconstruct the phase of your field. What we can do is use the method that is digital to modulate the field. For example, what we use generally is a specialized modulator. And you can replace your illumination source with photon pairs. In this case, I've got one photon that goes and interacts with the phase object. And I've got another photon that is modulated with a spatial light modulator, which is just a pixelated array where you can change the orientation of the liquid crystal to change the refractive index. And that will give you a phase modulation on the, across your field. And then at the end, what I would do is measure it. So you see that, for example, if I've got the quantum state that looks like this, the spatial light modulator is polarization sensitive, so it will only modulate one of the polarization. So in this case, it will be the vertical one. So you see that I will not get a phase term added to this guy, but I will get a phase term added here. So then when I reconstruct my field after that, I'll get a global phase file here that I pull out from the state. And then you will get the added phase from the spatial light modulator to this side here. So by doing some measurements and varying this phase as I did before, so here I've got some phase measurement here with it's equal to zero, pi, pi over two, and three pi over two. I can do the same now digitally if I just click on a computer and change that phase. And from the imaging result, I'll be able to get the phase of this object that I'm looking at here. So I'll just do that. So as I said before, we have a nonlinear crystal. Now, what we want is a state that looks something like this. The two photons have the same polarization, horizontal and vertical. So the way we generate them is we have a nonlinear crystal that generates photon by what we call type one down conversion. Type one simply means that the two photons that are emitted have the same polarization, which is orthogonal to that of the power. You get generally you get three types, so type zero, type one, type two. So type zero, they all have the same polarization. Type one, the two photons have the same, but it's orthogonal to the one. Type two, we have orthogonal polarization with two photons. So in type one, if I come in with vertical, I will get two photons that are in a horizontal polarization. And if I was to rotate this and also rotate the palms so horizontal, then I will get photons that are vertical. So the solution is just to get the sandwich crystal. One is horizontal, one is vertical. I turn my palm to 45 degrees. So the first crystal will generate horizontal photons for me. The second crystal will generate vertical photons. Now, for as long as the length of this crystal is lower than the coherence, the coherence length of the laser, you would get coherence between your horizontal and vertical photons. So if you want to use a pulse laser, for example, with a coherence length of a few micron, in your crystal a millimeter, then you would have a lot of trouble getting this. So what I get at the end is a state that is correlated in momentum from the down conversion process. And because of the overlap between the H and the B polarization, then I also get entanglement in polarization. So what I use now is I'm gonna use the momentum correlation as my carrier of information. If you think about telecommunication, it's like using a laser and then doing some modulation of the time to get the data out. This will be my carrier. 
I will use the special correlation with the technique I showed you before to get the correlated information. information. And then I will encode information in the phase of the entangled photon here, in the phase of the polarization. So this will be where the information about the object would lie. So going back, uh, yes. So first thing to do is to first characterize that we indeed have entanglement. So the way to do it is to measure both the uncertainty in the position and momentum basis. As I showed you before, you have some lenses here, depending on whether you are in a near field or far field. And you can measure then the intensity correlation. And then from the intensity correlation, what we do is we look at the sum or the difference, uh, the projection of the diff sum or difference coordinates. So what we do is we take that gigantic object we had before and we collapse along one of the diagonal or the other in the near field or the far field. And then we reconstruct something that looks like this. And then when you check from for spatial entanglement, you need to have a tight correlation in both position and momentum, such that the product is less than a half. So when we do it at the end, we get something that is about less than a half, so that confirms that we have spatial entanglement. Now, I also want to confirm that I've got polarization entanglement. The way we do it is a little bit more involved. So what we do here is um, we've got the spatial modulator to encode the phase. We're going to get our pair of crystal, which is here. And then at the end, I'm going to pass my two for some for polarizer and then look at it on the, on the camera. See how here I've got two cameras, but it really is just one camera. We use half of it for one beam and then the other half for the other. So what I'm trying to perform here is a CHSH inequality for those who are familiar with this. But if you want more details, we can talk about this. It just involves a series of measurement by keeping one, pol one polarization the same and bearing the other. We do it for four different orientations. And then at the end, you get something that looks like this. So for one photon, you fix the polarization that you measure, and then you vary for the other along four different orientations. And this will give you these, uh, all these images that you see here. And by combining it, you can then reconstruct the degree of polarization entanglement at every pixel on your ray. So you get an image that looks like this. So these two pictures are just symmetric images of each other, such that, so everything that is above two tells you that you've got entanglement in polarization, everything that's below two says you don't have entanglement. So this is a confirmation that you do have polarization entanglement across your field. You might see some dark regions here because the signal from every pixel is not perfect. You don't get always the, what you want at the end, but generally that tells you about what you see across your field. So the image then that we want to reconstruct in the phase is encoded in the special light modulator. So in this case, it was just the phase image that we, do with, that we made with letters. And using the other special light modulator for one photon, we changed the phase as I told you before. So the image that one that is encoded on one side is this one here. And that's the shape of the intensity that illuminates it. And at the end, we, reduce, we take four phase measurements along the different phase terms that are represented at the top. Then at the end, you combine them, and then you're able to reconstruct the phase of your image using the photon that did not see the image. But you can do the same with different samples. So here, what we use is bird feathers. So we did the same thing with bird feathers here. That's your phase image that we construct, and then the intensity amplitude is on this side here. Now you notice that this, all the samples that we use here works because they're biofringent. That's one reason why this works because we encode information is the polarization difference between H and V. So we needed a biofringent sample at this case, at this point. But there is a way to make the technique non-biofringent as well. So to do that, we just added a few extra elements at the end. So one is a savoir code if you work with it. It just basically speeds the polarization state and then we combine them at the end if you use two of them carefully. So then we insert the sample just in between one part of the foot and then for combining it. So then that allows us to be able to image samples that are not biofringent. So one of it was uh, some glue that we spray on this just pieces of glass here. We place it in the side. And then this is what you see on one side. That's, so this is a, the beam that comes this side will be here. And then the other one is here. Then you can extract the phase information by doing the same measurements we did before. 
So this is one example of how we can use uh, correlated photon to do imaging at the microscopic level. Another one that I want to tell you about is to use um, quantum interferometry to get an image out. So for those who are familiar with this, please excuse me, I'll try to explain this again, again for those who do not know. So if you have two identical photons that are incident on the beam splitter and they overlap exactly perfectly in the outputs, provided that the photons are identical in all the degrees of freedom, you will get destructive interference when they arrive at the beam splitter at the same time, and you will get constructive interference when you, they do not. So what you will see is that if I change the delay of one photon with respect to the other when they arrive at the beam splitter, so when I go off delay, you will see that the counts that the two detectors will record will give you zero when there's no delay, which means that when they meet at the beam splitter, somehow they will always be bunching together. They'll go this way or that way together, and they will never go separately. But once you move away from this position, the number of counts that you see between the two detectors together will start increasing. So they will start bunching together, they will start anti bunching together. So this signal here can be used for sensing and can also be used for imaging. So this is what I'm going to try and show you in the next few slides, how we use them for imaging. So the way it works is that got, pretend that you've got a sample that has different heights. So obviously the different heights, we assume that the sample is transparent, of course. The different heights, heights will introduce different delays in the path of the beam. And then one photon will not see the object. And at different points here, there will be two photons will meet different points along the, this axis here. And what you will get at the end is that depending on where the photons meet, so if I'm looking at this pane and then this pane here, then I will get the signal in blue. If I'm looking at the red here, then I will get the signal in red. So my, inter my interference pattern will shift left or right, depending on how much delay I've introduced it. <laughs> So if I position myself here at this one position of the index minus 10, and I just look at what I get. So photons that are being for the green would have this level of coincidences between the two detectors. The photons that went to the red path will have this level of coincidence and the blue one this one. So then this becomes a natural mapping of coincidence probabilities to spatial delay. So if I know the image of coincidence that I get from the from the count rates that I measure, I can directly then estimate what is the thickness of the sample at different position that I'm measuring at the moment. So experimentally, it's a little bit more involved this way. So I have here is just a source of intended points in the pain, another crystal. And then uh, oops. Then I will check for whether I've got photon branching or not. So because I've told you before, I've got correlation between these photons that are here. Obviously, I can use a technique that I described before to look at correlation. And you will see that if the photons are anti-bunching, I should get a, a zero here. If the photons are bunching, I should not get that. Now, the anti-bunching here comes from measuring correlation between this part, this part here, with itself. Because I told you, if you've got humble metal interference, as I've described before, then a two photon will start bunching on each side here. So if I want to measure the bunching itself, I'm going to put the two pictures here. If I want to measure the bunching, what I need to do is to measure the probability of getting photons at B and B as well, or in the surrounding, which will give me this part here. If I want to measure the anti-bunching, I'll measure for means of getting put on here and then here as well, which will give me this part here. So by analyzing the two, I can analyze and it show you at which point the photons are bunching, which points they're not bunching at all. So as we described before, if the photons are bunching, then I should get the zero correlation because my counts all went all the way down. So if the counts went down because they're bunching, then they must be anti-bunching. So if they start anti-bunching less, they will start bunching a bit more. And this is what we're going to measure when we change this optical delay between the two paths. 
So as I showed before, what we do is we evaluate the correlation at the at the peak here. So this is what happens when the you change the delay, then you get the anti branching signal here. And then on the other side, if I'm looking at this term here, what I'm getting is two curves. The reason why I've got two curves is because the peak that I should have here in this projection of coordinates is always removed because this tells me that pixel A is correlated with pixel B, which is always the case. So that doesn't give me any useful signal. So we're always artificially we remove that because it doesn't give any signal. So what we do here is we can estimate that using a fit or using the signal from neighboring pixels only. So that's why I've shown you two curves here. Depending on how you estimate it, you can get different signals, but you would always see that you get a bunching effect at least. So back to the setup. So then what we what we looked at before is what happens when you change the focal length of this lens here. Now I showed you before that in the near field, what that does is that by you focus the, your beam onto your crystal, you excite more or less correlation width. In the far field, the story is a bit different. You can imagine if I focus tightly my beam and I look in a far field of it, I will get a very large beam. It's like saying, you know, what happens if I get a small beam populating at infinity? You get a very large beam at infinity. So what happens is that when you focus your beam in the near field, in the far field, your correlation width becomes gigantic. So when that happens, then you start having a matching between one pixel, one correlation width, to a lot of pixels on your camera. And that destroys your interference visibility. So that's what happens when you change the focal length here. There is an optimum position at which you get maximum visibility. And when you move away from it, you get more or less visibility depending on where you are. So here I've tried it with a few different focal lengths here. And the optimum one that I got was when I was using 300 millimeter. So when you go beyond that, then you don't get anything good with that. Then again, what we can do is to look at the interference signal at pixel pairs as well. So if I only pick this one pixel with this pair here, and I just look at the correlation between the two, you can reconstruct as well the same interference signal that we had before. And you can do it for every pair of pixels. You always see this interference pattern that you, that you get. Or you can look at the whole beam. So as I told you before, this is the bunching pictures, this is the anti-bunching. So at zero delay, if you look at the anti-bunching, so for a bit of getting two photons in separate arms, okay. that goes to zero. Then they must all be going down one part of the interferometer or the other. That's why the bunching pictures is bright. So as I move away from it, then the anti-bunching goes brighter and the bunching signal goes darker. So what we do at the end is we use this map, these pictures, the contrast for each pixel along this line here to be able to estimate for a certain level of, uh, of signal that we have here, what is the corresponding delay at every pixel. So we use a fitting curve for every pixel to do that. So the first sample we had here was just some piece of glass where we put some paint into a cross pattern, not very accurate or scientific. So the, later we measure that with the profilometer. So this is the high variation across the sample. And then this is what you will see if you just look at the direct image of your sample. And then when you look in the correlation space, then you get something that is not very pretty here, but you're able to then isolate the counts here from the background and then to extract the picture of the image here. So then that gives you the height. So each color here corresponds to height. When these two pictures, each color corresponds to coincidence signals. But it's something a little bit better using this letters again. And this was again measured with a profilometer. So the height is about 8.5 micron. The peaks that you see here is just from the needle of the profilometer just changing abruptly the profile. So this regard is sharp peaks here. And then we, if you directly look at the intensity, you don't see anything. If you look in coincidence, which is this image here, you see something that has a very poor resolution. 
simply because this sample here requires a lot more details from Petrodos across pattern. And our camera, as I told you before, only has 32 pixels on one side and then 32 on the other. So not, not a lot of pixels to be imagined. But you can kind of see that there is something going on here. So what you did is just to get more information, we just did a raster scanning. So you change your, you shift your camera laterally along for three different uh, angles. And at the end, you combine the image into a higher resolution image. And you get something that looks like this. And then from the counts here, you estimate again the depth of your profile, which on average was, I think was about 8.3 micro on average. So that tells you about the depth profile with respect to the what you should get in field. So this is another way of uh, doing my, it's a way that we think we can be doing microscopy using quantum interferometry. And there's efforts at the moment to push this a bit forward to make the technique face sensitive. <laughs> Now, I think this is probably one of the last thing I'll mention is uh, using photon pairs, you inherently get a super resolution effect, which only comes from the fact that you get signal from two photons that land on two different pixels, and you're able to estimate the information that's in between the pixels, so to say. So, as I told you before, you have a situation where your two photos may land on one pixel, but also where the two photos may land on different pixels. So if you've got some, a camera that has a very good field factor, then you would be able to get signals from when one photo hits this pixel, the other one hits that pixel. And that should tell you about the level of detail that's happening just in between the pixel, or what would have fallen, fallen away if I just had one photo. So what we do at the end uh, from the from the correlation image that we get, by looking at correlation between one pixel and its neighbor, we want to estimate the information from the from the orange here. And by looking at each pixel with its correlated pair, we want to estimate the information in the blue. So then by combining the two into a into a larger array. What we do is that we just take this signal here and then we start it in between. That gives you the interpixel information that would have been lost. And the way to see it is what we had before was a personal resolution target on the side. So here, this is your source of photon pairs again. Send it onto a crystal. And on the other side, we had an LED that was also illuminating the sensor, just to add some noise to it. So what you see at the end is this, if you just look at the direct intensity. But if you just extract image from correlation of pixel with pixels, you get something that looks like that. And you'll see that you don't get any effect from the, from the stray light source because your photons are temporally correlated. So because of the temporal correlation, doing the acquisition and the processing as we do, naturally remove signals from uncorrelated lines. That's how we're able to isolate it from the signal from the LED. And this is what you will see here. Now, if you apply the technique before by looking at correlation with pixel with its neighbor, not with itself, then you're able to then combine it with the pixel to pixel uh, uh, correlation to be able to get a picture that looks a lot better this way. And this is when you look at just this area. You can see that there's a lot more details here compared to just using that one. But this is one of the benefits of uh, also using photon pairs for imaging. Now, I don't know how much time do I have? Um, five minutes. Okay, perfect, because I'm right at the end. So just leave you, just leaving you with a bit of outlook on what we need to do, or what I'm planning to do at INRS, is I want to explore these other methods of doing imaging, particularly in the case of entanglement-based imaging, there's quite a few papers out there on showing resolution improvement and phase super sensitivity with two photons. Mm -hmm. But I'm interested in going beyond two photons. For those who work in quantum optics, you'll know that gen generating two photons is very inefficient. Generating three or four is incredibly inefficient. But the benefit that you will see for imaging could be very good, especially if you then look at sources of photons that have a lot more efficiency. So generally we work in bulk waveguide, in, in bulk uh, optics. I'm interested in going into optical waveguide for the photon pair source that supports multiple modes. Now there will be some effort in you know, avoiding mode capping and so on. But I think if we can 
go beyond the two foot and fade, then we get a lot more benefits in the, in the imaging in terms of resolution and phase. But then again, there is a hurdle of how do you measure a three photon signal using a correlation image? There is no known way to do it that I know. So this was also something to be explored as well. And in terms of interference based quantum imaging, I'm interested in looking at doing imaging using photons that are very, very different wavelengths. For example, I want to look at infrared imaging and terrorist imaging as well, using visible light detectors. So this is quite neat because at the end, we do not need to do a coincidence measurements. So the acquisition here is a lot faster and you get a lot more signal at the end as well, less losses. So this is also one way to go into a region of the spectrum where the detectors are not available, but you can use your visible light detectors in this case here. So I just leave you with this final slide. If you know anyone who's interested to work in this field, I've got about six positions available for PhD students. If you know any master students, I'm also available to discuss. And then uh, thank you for listening to me today. So if you use uh, uh it was a very good talk. So if you use SPDC to uh to do uh, measurements to see the time for photon pairs of time, you have to tune the laser way, way down in amplitude and generate maybe one pair at a time in different modes. But in your case, uh, it seems like you can look at many, many modes at once because of the camera. Yeah. What is the limit in the I don't know that yet. That's a question that I want to know. Yeah. One thing is that yes. Ideally, you would like to generate only one photon per temporal mode. Yeah. But I'm interested to see what happens if you get more. You know, what happens to the contrast and resolution and so on. I don't know. I suspect at some point, if you've got too much signal, then you start getting photons of false correlation, as I would call it. Okay. You can imagine if I've got always photons that are here. Yeah. My camera might be confused that this photon might be correlated with something here when yeah. it's not. So I think at that point, this might be detrimental, but I don't know at, what's the level as well at the moment. So I understood you're limited now by the camera uh, resolution. Is that right? The pixel size? So pixel size is not great depending on which camera you use. But eventually, so imagine that you had a, mm -hmm. like, a, I don't know, megapixel or gigapixel yep. camera. Uh, would you be limited by the correlation length of the photons? And if so, yep. what, what is that? That will limit your your, your spatial mm -hmm. resolution. What, what is the size? Yeah. I don't know. So in this case, if you work with, uh, so actually it's depending on wavelength and then length of the crystal. So generally for a half a millimeter crystal, at the uh, four or five, you're looking at about three, four micron. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So it would be nice if you go for a shorter crystal, yeah. but the shorter the crystal, the lower the efficiency is. So there's a trade off as well that you always have. Thank you very much. Very nice. Uh, I, I was wondering about it uh, along the same way as you asked, but um, you must have some really stringent requirement on the temporal mode, frequency mode that you have in your pond. Uh, to generate the photons because the signal that I learned was going to be their statistics to become yeah. Um So, which kind of form are you using right now, and what is the the criteria to, to decide which so frequent frequent enhanced lens? Like, so at the moment is it's it's not too stringent at this in this moment because here the camera okay well even if i say that the spy camera journey has a long temp uh, it's a very narrow temporal resolution but it's not that great you know 10 nanoseconds is not too impressive but uh, the laser that i'm using for example here was a so i used two sets so one was a cw laser at four or five you can get it commercially nothing special the other one was a pulse laser simply because we had plans to do some some lighter experiments but that we didn't get to that one. So to do all these experiments, you don't need very sophisticated laser yet. I suspect that once you start making your crystal not very short and you want to use, for example, to do 3D imaging with uh, temporal information, then yes, that would need a little bit more elaborate. Yeah. So I also have a question along this line. So um, 
Am I understanding correctly that for the commando based uh, like imaging, right? Mm -hmm. So actually the resolution in phase would be like to the worst, your la your pump laser is the better the resolution is because you have a much like narrower commando diff, right? Yeah. If you get so if you get a very broadband pump, then yes, you get a very, very nice. So, so then it's like you just need a as actually a very broadband pump laser as broad as possible. To get but the, you need to have the, the face matching condition needs to ensure this uh indistinguishability between yeah. the same and the other yeah. symmetry in the drawn spectrum uh yeah. function, right? Okay. Yeah. yeah, if it's too broad, then you also decrease your visibility. Yeah, got it. Yeah. I mean, other questions? I'm sorry. Yeah, again, about the latent pump. So, um, in your case, I think it's like a single mold in terms of special, mm -hmm. right? For yeah. a, 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 yeah. And you, I mean, you probably don't get any benefits if you're like a multi mold and you can go into some kind of stability. Yeah. And one question. Uh, so going for a high order excitation, you're probably to get some sort of continuous variable correlation between uh, you know, the conjugate one and the other yep. position of the mode. So is there any technique to measure that camera, like just some sort of um, automatic interference, like control plus layer and stuff like that? None that I'm aware of. That's it. I know that people have done this measurement with single pixel detectors, but with the camera, I don't think I've seen it. One last question, if I can. Yeah. Uh, so, you showed a lot of benefit of using that for entangled components in terms of what we can do. Mm -hmm. My question is oriented toward um, how does it compare with uh, more classical techniques uh, using coherent fields, for example? Mm -hmm. and Maybe what I'm wondering is, is there a, a real, real clear advantage of using a SPD source rather than just splitting with a coherent field? So the main benefits for doing this whole quantum imaging is, so there's three of them. One is uh, the different Im imaging modality you can get. So for example, as I told you before, you have the ability to do imaging at wavelength where your detector is not sensitive. If you use non-degenerate uh, non sources, so, for example, if I was to image something in the near infrared, you would take a source of an infrared, you shine it on the detector, and then you will see it. But with the entangled photons, what you could do is just look at it with infrared, but measure with the visible, and you get low detected at low, much lower noise level, better signal to noise ratio there. So, this is one of the benefits in terms of imaging modality. In terms of resolution, if you take to say, I'm going to say, if you take photon pairs and a Korean fit at the same wavelength, you get an inherent benefit in resolution and phase sensitivity with the photon pairs. Now, the at the moment, what's lacking, I believe, in my opinion, is the technology. The technology for me is lacking behind at the moment because all these quantum experiments tend to take a very long time just because of the low signal level. So compared to a classical experiment, you could take all of this data in a few seconds with the quantum light, it might take a long time. So I think this is where we're lagging at the moment in terms of what's what's available to actually compete with classical with classical filter. And did you gain also a signal to noise ratio yeah. because you have a sub Yeah, again, again, yeah. 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 So there's been two experiments, I think, that I've, that I've focused on showing that. I think one was on focusing on sub short noise, but the other one was direct comparison of signal to noise ratio if you got yes. equivalent illumination. Thank you. Yeah. It's, uh, in the interest of time, I think uh, probably that's. <laughs>